Good morning. I encourage you, form a group, have a go, and uh, maybe even during the day at work, bring a couple of friends who maybe don't know the Lord, but uh, they want to answer the question, what on earth am I here for? So uh, let's not have massive groups. I reckon a group of three to five, maximum ten, let's just break loose right across the church, eh? And grab dozen, start dozens of new ones. In this series uh, on the book of Joshua, which we're reading in our daily readings, um, we're talking about getting ready as the people of God for the seasons ahead of us, like the 40 days campaign that starts in a few weeks. And that the Lord always goes before us. Today, I want to share about Jesus' call to fully surrender to him. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful chapter that we want to focus on today in, in the book of Joshua. I hope that you realise that the Lord isn't dependent on our help to expand his kingdom. We must never forget that Jesus is all sovereign, he is all powerful, and that he's always working to draw people to himself because of his amazing love for people. And that he is building his church here on earth till he returns. Our Lord is in heaven by our heavenly dad's side. But he's not just waiting. He is working. He is ministering. He is ministering from heaven even more effectively than when he walked this earth. Because now he's not limited by space and geography. And he's got the Holy Spirit who we can't see, whereas he we could Jesus, we could see while he walked this earth so that he can be in every place on planet earth, every church that meets on a Sunday morning or a weekend or throughout the week. He's our mediator between God and man. He's our intercessor. He's praying for us. I don't know what image you have of Jesus, but he is praying for you now. He really is. And uh, uh, he thinks of us and he's transformed. He has a, a glorified body, not like our limited body. And so he thinks of us, he prays for us, and he's our advocate or our defence attorney with our heavenly dad. Now, the devil can't touch the throne of grace. The devil may attack, the devil may try and hurt us, but we have somebody who's always on our side. He's our advocate and he's our high priest. And I love this passage in Hebrews 4. I want to read this to you. I love it because it encapsulates who he is, our mediator, intercessor, advocate, and high priest. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Notice that, not Jesus of Nazareth. He's fully human, Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus, the Son of God, is fully divine. It's a mystery. Fully human, fully God. This high priest of ours understands your weaknesses, he knows your failings. He knows your foibles. He knows your mistakes and, and difficulties and struggles in life. For he faced all of the same testings we do because he was fully a human being. Yet he didn't sin like we. We sin, he didn't sin because he was sinless. The eternal son was sinless. And Jesus of Nazareth, though he had a human body and he was tempted to sin and it was a vicious sin, he was able to withstand. But he understands the pain and the difficulty, he entered our experience, our, 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 our world. So because of this, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. You can come boldly. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Isn't that a beautiful picture of Jesus? When we take communion at the end of the service today, as we culminate the service in that, that uh, know that, that you can enter boldly and receive what you need from him. And so though the Lord in one sense doesn't need us to build his kingdom, yet on another level he does. He graciously chooses us and it's our privilege to join him in his grand rescue plan for lost humanity. And in chapter 5 of the book of Joshua, we read it a few days ago, before God sends his people out to defeat Jericho, which is the first city of Canaan, next week we're going to talk about how the walls came down. He reminds them of their need of him 
as without his saving help, they won't be able to defeat this impregnable fortress of Jericho with massive walls. And he asks this new generation of Hebrews to surrender themselves afresh. And he instructs Joshua to resume two great covenantal rites that had not occurred for many, many years, nearly 40 years, that distinguished them as the people of God. That they were doing in Egypt when they were in bondage to Pharaoh for 400 years. And they did it once at Mount Sinai. But now he says, okay, you, wanna, you need to surrender yourselves again. And, uh, and so in chapter 5, we see what he does. And, and uh, they're, they're amazing, amazing things. The first was the consecrating ritual of circumcision. And all the men went, ooh. Because <laughs> it was done to all the growing up men. In our day and age, where circumcision is still practiced usually for little bubbies. As this new generation needed to be identified this way, just as their fathers were, circumcision was the entrance point of identifying that you actually are the people of God. The cutting off of a piece of flesh, an identifying feature to say, now you're a Hebrew. It wasn't done for this generation. It was for their fathers in Egypt and in the wilderness, but not for the kids that are now growing up. The second was to reinstitute the celebratory and remembrance feast of Passover that hadn't been adhered to since they escaped the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And so the night that they were freed, you can read it in Exodus, they, they instituted the Passover feast. And that's where God delivered them out of, out of Egypt. And then at Mount Sinai, when the Ten Commandments came, they, they also... Uh, when they camped there in the wilderness, in the Sinai Desert, they also uh, did the Passover celebration. They hadn't done it now for 40 years. So two things, circumcision and Passover. Joshua recognised that Israel needed to rededicate themselves to the Lord's service before she could undertake the Lord's warfare and take possession of the promised land. The land was theirs. The Lord had promised the land of Canaan was theirs. He promised it to Abraham in Genesis 12. He promised it to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, to Moses, to Joshua. It was theirs. All the, the promises are filled throughout the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and in Joshua. But for them now to actually possess it required that they not just rely upon that God has given us his word, therefore how we live, how we conduct ourselves, our attitudes, our behaviours, to have nothing to do with it. To possess the promise, to outwork it, to actually cross the River Jordan and to defeat Jericho, the first fortified city of many cities, they needed to rededicate themselves, to surrender all to him again. And so I see in this... And I'll come, we'll read a little bit of, of, of chapter 5 in, in a little bit, a few moments. These two ceremonies in the Old Testament, in chapter 5 of, of Joshua, are beautiful pictures of present day spiritual realities in our era, this New Testament era. They depict the surrendered life. The first thing is we are continually encouraged throughout the New Testament to be a consecrated people. If we're going to be to surrender all, we've got to consecrate ourselves, the entirety of our lives, to be a, constant, a concentrated, concentrated, consecrated people who are allowing Jesus to circumcise not a physical part of our bodies, but to circumcise our inner life, our hearts, our desires, our aspirations, our thoughts, the inner being of where comes our values and our ideas and our dreams and our visions, our behaviours, our words, our thoughts come from within. If we're going to be fully devoted followers of our master, we need an initial circumcision of heart. And I tell you, folks, we need continual circumcision because our hearts can easily become calloused and get off centre. 
I love what, what Paul says in, in, his, in his letters about circumcision and the analogy of circumcision to this inner transformation. Look at Colossians 2. It says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised. No, I wasn't. <laughs> but not by physical procedure, he says to Colossians. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Hallelujah. Wow. Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, came within and set you free from the sin, the power of sin that was driving you to do the wrong thing. Not only were your sins forgiven through Christ, but the very power of sin was neutralized. That now we have the the ability through him not to be dictated by the old, but to live in the new. He says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. So he says, when you got baptized in water, if you haven't been baptized in water, uh, get baptized in water. It doesn't save you, but it's, it's, it's a physical representation of what God has done, that he circumcised your heart. The old life is dead. So what do you do with dead bodies? You've got to bury them. And that's what water baptism is, a burial service. You put them down. And the more you've sinned, the longer we keep you under. <laughs> that's why some of you don't want to be baptized because you know you'll be under there for three or four hours. <laughs> and with him you were raised as Christ rose from the dead and went to heaven. And now he's our high priest. He sent the Holy Spirit. You were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Hey, I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. He has circumcised my heart and he has circumcised most of your hearts. You wouldn't be a Christian otherwise. And we rejoice in that. But you know, it requires a continual process. Look, Philippians 3, I love this one. Paul says, for we who worship God in the spirit are the only ones who are truly circumcised. We put no confidence in human effort. You can't change yourself by human effort. You can't change anything. God's the change agent. Jesus in us is the transforming power of God. Instead, we boast about what Christ Jesus has done for us. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Only as we keep our focus on Jesus and allow him to inhabit every room of our lives Will we have the desire and strength and power to live above the temptations that are many and the values of, this, of the antichrist dimensions of the world around about us? Boy, we need, we, we need uh, to allow him to keep circumcising our hearts. You know, when you, in chapter 7, which we read uh, two days ago, is the story of Achan, Achan's sin and the battle of Ai, and when you read that in chapter 7. So they defeat Jericho, and we'll talk about that next week, or Pastor Cass will. And, uh, but the Lord said, you, can, you cannot steal. Because all the goods, it goes, they've got to go into, the, into God's treasury. And, and God says, this is, so please, he says, don't, don't take anything. Remember, you are the Lord's agent and you've got to expel these foreigners. You've got to put them to the sword. There was a, a, a capital offence that came upon the peoples of, of Canaan. And, uh, and so, as they did that, but what happened was one man named Achan and his family decided to steal some gold and silver and jewels and buried them in his tent. It was found out. And sadly, Achan and his whole family were stoned. And uh, uh, Joshua just tears his clothes. He doesn't know what to do. And he says, because they go to fight in Ai, the next city, and they get defeated. And, and he thinks, well, we didn't lose a person in Jericho, and that was a bigger city. Ai is a little small city. And the Ai, Ai it's called the city, they routed the, the Hebrews, and 36 of their men were killed. And he says, well, what's going on? God, have you let us down? And he's crying his eyes out. And God says, cut it out, Joshua. Look, Israel sinned. Sins come into the camp. But they were circumcised at Gilgal. <laughs> For they took the Lord's Supper, the Passover. Achan did too. 
he was circumcised and his family and they took the Passover but somehow they let the world's temptations come in and sadly sin came into the camp and it had to be ruthlessly dealt with and it's easy for us for the weight of 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 sin to, to come upon us and to weigh us down and to and to hinder what Jesus wants to do for us to be able to possess all the lands that he has for us for all the promises to be at work in our lives I love what Paul says in um, when actually after that happens and Achan uh, has to die and his whole family then then it's interesting Joshua then builds an altar in a place called Mount Elbal in chapter 8 and he reconsecrates the people so it's not a one-off event to be surrendered to live a surrendered life requires outward circumcision yes it requires taking the Passover but here it's really the inner life that needs to change. And so in, in our New Testament era, this is what Paul talks about. I love Colossians 3 in the message, and it can't be clearer. This is Paul speaking. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other, because we're all members of the body. None of this going off and doing your own thing. Hey, you don't live for yourself. You, you, you live in relationship with others. And cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house in your life. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out to God when you come to church. When you have the beautiful Laura and the team leading us in singing. You have my permission to sing your hearts out. Don't just go, yeah, the Lord is good and God is great. And yeah, yeah, he is good. Hey, Read what you're singing about. This is good news. And as you sing your heart out, something happens. The Holy Spirit likes that. He lives within you saying, okay, I'm in this room and this area, but you're letting me now into another bit of a room. You open up your heart. Let, let, let him in your life. Let him flow through you. I don't care if you use the gift of tongues while Laura leads us in singing. Just do it quietly to yourself. Just worship him. I do it all the time in the front row. Nobody can hear me except Michael. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. This is what a surrendered life looks like, folks. This is what continual circumcision is about of our inner life. And if we're going to be a surrendered, a surrendered church, We've got to be a consecrated church. Secondly, to stay surrendered to, to Jesus, we are to be a celebrating people who are continually remembering what it's all about. And that's what the Lord's Supper is. We don't call it Passover today. We just don't do it once a year. We endeavor to do it once a month. We do it in all of our services. We try uh, in our, our, our life groups. I'd love them to do it every month or six weeks or so in a smaller group as leaders when we meet together. And it's important because it's where we can realign ourselves to his call and purpose for our lives and never forget the cross. Yeah. Always having the cross before us and the world behind us. Always ensuring that it's about Jesus and what he has accomplished for us through his life, death and resurrection and now his ongoing ministry. We see and experience Jesus afresh when we remember his death and it inspires us to keep sharing with our loved ones and friends the good news about the saving message of Jesus. It's to remember him and to be inspired to proclaim him, to let people know. So the more we lift up the cross, the more we get a vision of the cross and who Jesus is and what he has done for you and, and what he wants to do collectively for us and, and what he wants to do in and through us, the more empowerment we receive to want to share about him to those around about us. Remember the two men on the road to Emmaus in, uh, in Luke 24, verses 30 to 31? Really interesting. And uh, they don't recognize Jesus. And uh, some people think, oh, the Lord just blinded them so they couldn't recognize him. I, I just think they just weren't expecting him to be risen from the dead. They just were just, he's dead, he's dead, he's gone. And they're down and depressed and, and they're walking there and Jesus turns up and, and uh, they don't recognize him. 
he doesn't go, da da, here I am, look at the wounds. He just, he just walks with them and tries to, and he sows the word, the word about himself from Genesis all the way to Malachi. And he opens up the scripture. And afterwards, the guy goes, Man, weren't our hearts strangely warm when he talked? The, the, the understatement of, this, of, of history. Jesus, the author, gives them a personal Bible study. I oh, mean, what a Bible study that would have been from Janet. So, and they still don't quite get it. And then he breaks bread. He has a meal with them. They ask him to stay. And it says, they broke bread. And then it goes, it wasn't a communion service. But it then says, then their eyes were opened and they knew him. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. As we take the Lord's Supper today and break bread and take wine, for some of you, may your eyes be opened. May you come to know him. If you haven't given your life to Christ, may he turn up through the power of his spirit and grab your heart and, and encourage you to open it up so that you can say yes to him. He won't break the door of your heart down. He'll just knock. So I'm here. That you'll get a vision of the cross, that you'll see him, that you'll experience him. Like the Hebrew people in Joshua's time who needed to reconsecrate their lives, we so need to constantly remember as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, remember who Jesus is. Give thanks for what he has done for you. Appreciate what he wants to do in you over the next, this season. And for us collectively as a church community. Now going back to Joshua, after the men were circumcised and they had a bit of a break, it took a few days for healing to occur, as you can imagine. And, and after they celebrated the Passover, they received a powerful encounter with God. Now I've never kind of connected this before, but I'm, I'm in driving my car into the city every day over the past week or so. I've been just getting Joshua read to me by the message, by New Living Translation and, and, and that. So I've just been reading the whole thing. I've read chapter one through to all of it and, and it just dawned on me what takes place now occurs after the rite of circumcision, after them celebrating the Passover. And I saw the connection with us now. Beautiful. I want to read this to you. Joshua 5, 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, they'd crossed the River Jordan and he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, bold as brass, he doesn't recognise what was happening. He goes, are you for us? Or for our enemies? The man goes, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked, oh, what message does my Lord have for his servant? God actually turned up. These are mysterious things that happen in the Old Testament. We call them theophanies. Well, others will call him a Christophany. They think the eternal son, before he became Jesus of Nazareth, the father would send him on missions and he would appear like in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, whatever his name is. As they're about to be burned up in this furnace, there's another man walking in there. Who was that fourth man? It wasn't Jesus of Nazareth, it was the eternal son appearing manifesting himself and here because the response of Joshua is oh, worship he bows down and the commander of the Lord's army replied take off your sandals boy for the place where you're standing is holy only God says things like that and Joshua did so <laughs> and then in chapter 6 now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites no one went out and no one came in the place was full of fear it was, it was locked down. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. We see here that they were not only a consecrated people and a celebrating people, 
And that's what we're encouraged to be. But we need to be a commanded people. Joshua gets empowered and receives encouragement and specific direction from the heavenly commander about how to overcome the seemingly impossible task of of conquering Jericho. Because it was a big city and there were big walls. And the commander gives him instructions because no one could come up with the idea of how to knock off those walls. It was weird. You read chapter 6, think, what the heck? That's how you're going to defeat Jericho? Yep. That'll show it's God that gives the direction. It's God's power. It's God's direction. And so Joshua was not the leader. God was the leader. He was the commander. He was the under him. If, if Jesus, we could say Jesus was the, the field marshal, we are, say, the generals or the colonels. So he receives instruction of how to overcome Jericho. Wow. Do I see here that from this that we don't have to fight to receive our promised inheritance? You then, and then simply ask God's, for God's help. Rather, we are to fight God's battles to possess our land by outworking his battle plans and by following his specific directions. And in today's reading, if you've read today about the Gibeonite deception, what an amazing story. It fits in well with my message today. The Gibeonites are a city. Now remember, he's been asked, you've got to wipe them all out. He goes, there's a death, there's a capital sentence upon the people of Canaan. And I won't go into the reasons for all that. It just was uh, a shocking state of affairs with what they were doing. Uh, the killing of babies and, and uh, the, the uh, infant sacrificial system that they had and the terrible immorality and viciousness, the ethics were just a, a terrible thing. God said, look, you've got, you've got to remove this and you've got a, a new nation state where I'll be king and I want laws and ethics and values and respect for life to, to operate, uh, to occur there. And so, but the Gibeonites heard this, this group, man, these Israelites are going to, so what they did, they came up with a ruse. They made out they'd come from a, from a long distance, they wore old clothes and had, you know, sort of... Uh, um, bread that was mouldy and, and, and wine skins that were half broken. They were, pretty, they were pretty good. They should have won an Oscar for this one. And they turn up and the Israelites go, hey, you guys, where are you from? Oh, we're from a far country. And, and Joshua and the guys go, hmm. They, they, there's something within us a bit suspicious and they interrogated them. Are you sure you're not from here? And they give this, spin the story and they believe the ruse. And interesting, it says this, in chapter 9, 14, but they did not ask the counsel of the Lord. They didn't ask the commander of the armies of the Lord, what should we do? So they immediately rely upon their own reasoning rather than praying and calling on God and saying, you're the commander. What should we do in this situation? Disaster befalls them. The Gibeonites are allowed to live. They signed a covenant and the Gibeonites and their offspring ultimately caused a lot of problems in the history of Canaan, all the way through the book of Judges, the books of, of Samuel, the Philistines, and the other, the other ites that were there because they didn't eliminate them, and it caused them a lot of difficulties. They didn't inquire of the Lord. See, Jesus wants to be our personal commander, guys. He wants to be our church commander, and he will ever be your guide. And he loves to lead you to be able to outwork the specific ministry and mission tasks that he has for you and for our church and for our Christian Family Centre churches. He really wants to be that. To live a surrendered life requires that we be a consecrated people, that we be a rejoicing people, really uh, celebrating the Lord, remembering and proclaiming and to be a commanded people. We're under command, we're under orders. One of the sad parts of the story of Joshua, when you read through to the end of it, is that as the years passed and Joshua becomes an older man, into his 80s, 90s, his generation, his people, and then their kids didn't follow this spiritual pattern and they lost their way. Terrible, really. 
And uh, many hardships and disasters followed. And you can read it in, in Joshua 23 and 24 where the old boy is appealing to them and saying, guys, guys, remember, remember, to live a surrendered life. You know, be constantly consecrated and to celebrate and, and to let him be the commander. And, uh, and you can read the first chapters of Judges and it's, it's terribly sad. It's a sobering challenge for us as we are transitioning to a new generation of leaders and people. The CFC will be 44 years old on Mother's Day in May this year. And those of us who were not part of the, the beginnings, some of us were <laughs> there from the beginning. And, uh, but many of you were not part of the wanderings for the first 10 years across the western suburbs or involved in seeing the miracles of provision regarding land and putting up buildings the next 10 years. 10 years of wandering, 10 years of putting up, buying land and facilities, miracles galore, amazing. And then the establishment of our Christian Family Centre churches and our world missions vision where we're touching nations over the past 25 years or so. You weren't part of it. And so the kids of Joshua's generation don't remember slavery in Egypt. They don't remember the wanderings. They don't remember the battles to take the promised land. Because when Joshua, what, what they got, when Joshua then partioned out the land, and the second half of the book of Joshua is the division of the land. And so now, only two cities were knocked over. The rest of the cities they took over. The vineyards weren't burnt. They just took over the vineyards. And, and so all of a sudden, <laughs> from being wandering, and the manna stopped coming from heaven, didn't need any more miraculous food. They had food there. So all of a sudden they've got vineyards, pomegranates, cabbages, tomatoes, cauliflowers, zucchinis. What else? Hey, all the good stuff. Land was flowing with milk and honey. And they just saw the milk and honey. They didn't see the bees and the bulls though. Where you got milk and honey, you've got bees and you've got bulls. And bees sting and bulls. So the Gibeonites, they let those bees and bulls live. And they rose and they ultimately started goring them and had a lot of trouble. But the people relaxed. Oh, and they focused on the material blessings of God. The promised land is now theirs. And they forgot. So the material blessings became their focus rather than the spiritual author who was God who gave it to them. Hey! And they relaxed. Oh, they, yeah, yeah we've, got to, we've got to circumcise this boy. Yeah. Yeah, we do the Passover once a year. But it was like rituals. Their hearts were far removed. And what happened was they intermarried when they shouldn't have intermarried. Because to intermarry means you're going to bring the Baal gods, devil gods, and the Asherah devil gods, and all the evil practices that took place. They compromised. For us... It's easy for compromise to come in. Church history is filled with it. Churches that were going places, that were biblically based, Christ-centered, people loving, Holy Spirit dependent, moving forward, they lose their focus. They don't stay surrendered. Consecration becomes, oh yeah, the world will, let's just, you know, like, they're compromised. And for us, we must never lose our spiritual cutting edge and wander from our vision and stray from our values. When I became a Christian, Leo Harris was the great leader of the CRC. He founded the CRC. He went to be with Jesus at 57 years of age, like nearly 10 years younger than me now. Like, and he was fit and strong. And, and, uh, and, and so I only knew him for six years. 1971 to 1977. So when I joined the church, I wanted to know everything. I wasn't there in Napier, New Zealand, when God gave him the vision. I wasn't there when he came to Adelaide for a three-week campaign and then stayed. I wasn't there when he went pioneering churches. I wasn't there when they got their first building. I wasn't there when they set up the bar. I wasn't there when they started planting their churches. But you know what I discovered? I found his books. And I read all his books. And I, and I tracked through his journey. 
And as I'm reading and reflecting, I felt like I've embraced his journey. I've picked up the vision. I've grabbed the values. I'm like, yeah, I was there with you, Leo. Back there, oh, yeah, I, was, I can feel it when you were there in Napier, New Zealand. Yeah, I was there when Operation Outreach was launched. Yeah, when Sunrise House was purchased and when the new facilities were done. And I walked with him in my heart and mind. And you know, that's never left me. Even though I wasn't there, I was there in my heart and mind. And even though you may not have been here from the beginning, you can be there in your heart and mind. That's one of the reasons why I've written those three books. The me I can be, the church we can be, the leader I can be. I've tried to put down the stories so that you can grab it and read and go, did that really happen? And you can say, Pastor Bill, is that really true? And I say, well, I think it is. I say to my wife, did that really happen? I say to Philip, because sometimes as the years go by, you think, did that really happen? So you can come on the journey from our wanderings and in our development. And Nathan and, and Leslie have actually taken down about uh, 15 hours of oral history and, and, and uh, Leslie's done a 600 page manuscript of my whole life journey. So I'm gonna kind of, I'm working on that a bit so ultimately it'll come out as a, so that in a generation's time, People can read it. You see, what Joshua did in Mount Elbow, when, they, when, when the sin of Achan occurred, he got them to read all of Moses' law again. He goes, I want you to read it. I want you to get it on the inside. But somehow it didn't transmit from Moses to Joshua to the judges' generation. And my prayer is that it will transmit, that the Christian Family Centre, that this generation and the next generation, the Joshuas who are here, that your generation, the next generation, the, your kids, that they will pick it up and have it and that this, this church will continue to grow and that our dozen or so churches will have 120 churches that will be in so many nations that we won't lose sight of uh, our, our direction. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's do some spiritual business with Jesus this morning as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We've got a few minutes and we need to do that. I want, wonder if the ushers would like to, to come and bring the emblems to us. If you are one of our guests here today and, and you don't know what the Lord's Supper is, it's taking a bit of bread and a bit of wine. It's not alcoholic, a little biscuit. It speaks of Jesus' death on the cross. It's not the Christian Family Center's Supper, it's the Lord's. I want you to take a piece of biscuit and a piece of a bit of wine, just hold it there. We're going to sing a song and we're going to remember Jesus. And for some of you, you're going to have an encounter with him. If there's faith in your heart, you can see Jesus through the emblems. You can take and say, oh, a bit of, a bit of fruit juice and a bit of biscuit. No, I'm just taking. But if you love the Lord or if you're seeking after him and there's faith in your heart, arising and you see the cross and who Jesus is and what he's done for you revelation can come the commander of the armies of the Lord can appear to you and touch you and direct you let's sing the song as